morning, I'm Theola and today I'll be reading Luke 12, 13 to 34 from the New International Version Translation. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you. Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said to them, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but not is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap. They have no store or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the fields, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. The pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For your treasures, there your heart will be also. And I'd also really like to thank God for Ian and pray that he's led by the Spirit today and that his words just really touch people's heart and that he can be a shepherd to the church. Thank you, Theola. That was a great reading. Great to be able to see you on the live stream as well. Um, that was an amazing time of worship this morning, wasn't it? Could so intensely feel the sense of the presence of God. And uh, through this pandemic, what we really, really need to be doing every step of the way is pushing ourselves deeper and deeper into the presence of God. I just want to remind you that you've got me for the next couple of weeks because next week is our Vision Sunday and we're going to give an update on the Restore Vision and our next steps as a congregation. And also next Sunday, we're going to have a special giving day as well. We're so grateful to the tech team and uh, the way that they've led us through this last year. Can you believe it's a year now that we haven't been able to physically meet, but we've been having to meet online. And uh, we now know the equipment that we need to purchase as Restore for our next steps moving forward. So we're going to have a giving day towards that next Sunday. We're asking God for £50,000. I'd be very happy if we had more than that. Um, why don't you use the next week just to be praying and asking God about that and to think what you want to sow in to our next steps as Restore as we move forward. Today we're going to be continuing our journey through the Lord's Prayer. You know this season from now till Easter we're using to soak our local communities uh, and in, in prayer and pray the presence of God into them. This week we're going to have some uh, prayer walk options that we're going to release so uh, to help that process of walking around the local community praying God's kingdom to come and as our framework for that we've been looking through the Lord's Prayer. Now the Lord's Prayer is Jesus's pattern to teach us how we should pray and uh, we probably most of us uh, know it off by heart but it's not something to recite off by heart it's actually something to lead and guide us as we pray and we know that prayer is our lifeblood in terms of our relationship with God but what's really important is Jesus didn't just say pray he said pray this 
and uh, on the different weeks, and if you missed any of them, it'd be good to replay them, but on the different weeks, we look to begin with about how prayer is coming to a uh, father, it's coming to a father who loves us, who's for us, who wants to hear, who understands the cries of our hearts and wants to partner with us. Then we looked at how Jesus instructs us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And as a church, we're all about seeing the kingdom of God, the fragrance of Jesus released wherever we are. And then Trina gave us that word about living each day and asking God for his daily bread, for all that we need for every day and living on a day by day dependency on him. Then Stuart did a great week on uh, purity of heart, some of the stuff that maybe was being rekindled today as we were worshipping and talking about living on holy ground, being a pure and holy people. And Jennifer did a wonderful talk last week as well in terms of our relationships with one another and standing up for things that are important and protecting one another and covering one another. And I'm going to wrap up the series this week by talking about the whole issue of temptation. So if you're a mother, then uh, we celebrate Mother's Day with you, but put those chocolates down right now because they are a temptation for you. No, I was only joking. You can eat the chocolates. And actually, I'm going to say some really strong things. So you might want to be eating the chocolates as you go through this morning. But our topic for today is all about temptation. Now, temptation is an interesting word in and of itself. Um, Really what we're going to be looking at today is recognising the things that if we don't address them in our life, have the power to undermine us, and maybe not just undermine us, but actually ultimately maybe take us out and stop us from from achieving the purpose that God has for us. Which is why it's really important that we learn to recognise the things that we can be tempted with, but also learn the tools for overcoming those temptations. Now, when you look at the New Testament, it's really interesting because the same Greek word is used for testing as is used for temptation. And I found a really good table that describes the difference between testing and temptation, because in many ways, they're like two sides of a coin. Um, And the uh, result of them depends on how we respond to them. And so the table that shows the difference between testing and temptation is this. Testing is something that God lets us go through because it reveals our moral qualities or our character. And there's an opportunity in that for them to be moved into conformity with the nature of Christ. So testing, God lets us go through as a means to help undeceive us, that we might see clearly. And it's aimed at the person's good, making him more aware of his need for God and of God's glorious ability to supply all of his needs according to God's riches in Christ Jesus. It's the work of God. It's not a pleasant thing. It's not an easy thing, but it can be a really good and powerful thing. Temptation, on the other hand, the other column, temptation deceives and persuades to evil, so it may corrupt and ruin. Temptation seeks to deceive, just like the story of Genesis chapter 3. It aims at leading the person, consciously or unconsciously, into increasing independence and separation from God and his revealed will. And it's the result of the world, the flesh, or the work of the devil. And as I said, sometimes it's hard to discern what's testing and what's temptation. For example, when Jesus was led into the desert at the very start of his ministry, it says he was led there by the Holy Spirit, but then in the the desert he was tempted by the devil. But God used that refining process to make Jesus stronger. And when we're in seasons of testing and temptation, it's our choices in the midst of them that determine the outcome from them. So it's it's our choices and our response, the choices we make under pressure, that determine whose agenda then prevails in our life. And if we make good choices, God is able to work all things for good. There's some verses that I'll put up on the screen right now um, that uh, just demonstrate this. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God. So this morning, if you're coming under temptation, this morning, if you're struggling in a time of testing, if you put yourselves into the hands of God, God can use even the most horrendous thing. He can use it to bring good out of. The key is we put it into his hands. The end of Genesis, there's the story of Joseph when he's reunited with his brothers and he recounts or he reflects on the times that they sold him into slavery and betrayed him. And he says, you meant evil against me, 
But God meant it for good. God's brought good out of it. And in the book of Ephesians, something we teach often when we go through our Living Free course, um, but Paul writes, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't give the devil a foothold. And when we're in times of squeezing, when we're in times of temptation, what we have to do is think about our response. And if we respond in the right way by putting ourselves deeper into the hands of Jesus, surrendering ourselves more fully into the hands of Jesus, Jesus will use it ultimately for our good. But if we respond in the wrong way, like in Ephesians chapter 4, we end up giving ground to the enemy. And it's the ground that we give to the enemy that can undermine our calling from God. In Matthew chapter 26, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says to the disciples, he says, Watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And every one of us, we have that battle between what in our hearts and in our spirits we want to do, which is the right thing, but the fallenness, the weakness that we have, that we carry, the vulnerability that we carry in our flesh. And what Jesus is saying to the disciples is you need to be alert and recognize what your weaknesses are. Because if you recognize what your weaknesses are, you can protect that ground and then the enemy won't be able to take you out. And what's interesting in Luke's account of the Lord's Gospel, uh, the Lord's Prayer, is when it carries on in Luke chapter 12, he unpacks this whole issue of temptation and he unpacks some of the things that we need to watch out for because if we don't deal with them, they could take us off track. And there's two things in Luke chapter 12 that he says, beware of, and then there's one thing that he says to do. So this morning we're going to look at two bewares and one be or do. So if we pick up on our first beware, it's this says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So Jesus says, what you need to watch against is you need to watch against hypocrisy. And the Greek word that is used there for hypocrisy, it's the same word that you would use for an actor. And so what Jesus is saying is watch out that you're not pretending to be something that you're not which is what an actor or an actress does. Watch out that you don't pretend to be or present what you are not, because that will lead you into hypocrisy, and that will be a snare that the enemy will try and take you out with. So what Jesus is saying is he's saying, be authentic, be open. And you see, the problem with presenting something that isn't really us is we end up living a double life. And if we end up living a double life, the danger is we'll be found out and we'll end up discrediting the name of Jesus, but also hurting a lot of people. I don't know if, you've, if you keep up with the Christian world and things. I was heartbroken to read about the fall of Rabbi Zacharias. And actually, I find it really painful to read any of those stories of people in ministry who we put our trust in, who we get inspired by, and then something comes into the light and we realize the person who we thought they were isn't really who they were because they're living a double standard. And in James, it says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And at some point, the ministry crumbles. And why I find it really hard to read about it is I've been through some of those instances in the past. I've been in churches at times that uh, people in ministry have fallen. And what grieves me so much is the impact on people around. And it devastates the church, it devastates the family, it devastates the community of God, and it devastates our witness for Jesus. And Jesus is saying... Don't be like that. Now, I know all of us, to some extent, have times that we have to put on a happy face when we don't always feel like it. I know this will be a a real shock to you, um, and so just prepare yourself for a real, real shocker. It isn't always perfect in the king household. I know that's a shocker. And you know, there are some Sundays, not many, because I love such a privilege to be called by God and have the opportunity to do the things that I do. But you know, there's some Sundays that I have other stuff going on in my life 
and I'd rather not have to stand in front of you and speak the word of God. And in those moments, I have to make a choice. Okay, I'll, I'll park that for the moment. I'll push into Jesus and I'll do the things that I need to do. And all of us, in terms of navigating through the mess of life, we all have moments like that. But you see, what you then need to do is you need to go back to those things that you've parked and deal with them. Because otherwise, if you don't go back and address them, you'll end up living a double life. And when you're living a double life, you're caught in that place of hypocrisy. And if you're not careful, the enemy will take you out through it. And in what follows in Luke chapter 12, Jesus gives us the antidote to making sure we're not hypocrites. And he says two things that are the keys to getting out of hypocrisy and into authenticity and humility before God. The first one is this, it's transparency. He says, there's nothing concealed or hidden that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. It's actually a really interesting uh, section to read through because he talks about what you've said in secret I will shout from the rooftops. And he says, don't get caught out, bring out into the light. And the way we protect ourselves from hypocrisy is with an openness of heart and a transparency and authenticity and accountability into relationships. And life is hard. And when life is hard, things get squeezed up to the surface. This last year has been a challenge for many, many of us. Actually, if you look at the stats, the number of people running to alcohol has massively increased over the last year. The number of uh, uh, incidents of domestic abuse massively increased over the last year. The incidents of, of the use of pornography massively increased over the last year. Why? Because people are under pressure and they're looking for comforts. But if you run to alcohol, if you let your anger get out of control, if you run to find comfort in pornography, ultimately it will lead you to a double life that has the potential to undermine you. And it's easy to talk about these issues, isn't it, and say, well, that's out there in the community. But I suspect it isn't just out there in the community. I suspect it's in some of our hearts and some of our lives. What have you run to for comfort over the last year when you've been struggling? That will help you to see and understand what your vulnerabilities are according to the flesh. And Jesus says the way out of it is to own up and bring it into the light. What I want with all of my heart is that restore as a church, we carry the heart of Jesus. So we're non-judgmental. We journey through brokenness. We're not afraid of the mess. And we have the courage to bring our stuff into a loving community that is willing to walk and journey through because then we can find freedom. See, anything that, you're, that you have that's hidden and long-term hidden has the potential to take you out because you fear all the time being discovered. And so the best thing is don't wait until God puts you in a corner when you're exposed. Make a choice to bring it out into the open. We have a prayer team online this morning. You can click on the chat stream. You can click live prayer. Maybe for some of us, we don't need to go any further in the sermon. We just need to make that click and own up to some of the stuff that is going on behind the scenes. Because truly, truly, it will liberate you and it will set you free. And Jesus says one of the keys to, uh, uh, to free us from hypocrisy, from living a double life, is transparency. The other thing he talks about is the fear of God, the fear of the Lord. Now, we know in the Bible, it talks a lot about don't fear. There's one fear in the Bible that Jesus says we should have. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body. That's what it says in the verse. And after that, there's no more they can do. But I warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Do you know, we're called to have a godly reverence. We're called to recognise the awesomeness of God. When it talks about fearing God, it doesn't mean... what. what, what 
what Jesus means is don't cower in the corner from God because he's a good father. But what he says is recognise that he's holy. Recognise that he's awesome. Recognise that he's pure. Recognise that as much as he's, he's, he's a loving father, he's a consuming fire. And be ruthless in your determination to get rid of things that would stop you from pleasing him. There's a number of great verses about the fear of the Lord, particularly in Proverbs, but if we uh, put them up on the screen now. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. As Jesus followers, we're called to not worry what people around us think, but to make sure we're pleasing God with the way that we live. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. What about this one? The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth, I hate. See, the problem for most of us is we like the things that we're tempted with. And if we like the things that we're tempted with, it's really hard to give them up. And you know the best antidote if you like the thing that you're being tempted to, is to say to God, God, give me your heart for it. Because God's heart is to hate what is evil. And we need a change in our hearts so we can then resist what is evil. And you see, many of us, we we pray for revival and we long for revival. And we long to see a move of the Spirit of God. And we do, I do, with all of my heart. That's what I'm looking to God for. That's what I'm longing to God for. For a significant move of God that changes this nation. But we need to know that God isn't going to move like that if we're not in the right place with him, which is a holy people. And we also need to understand that when God moves like that, when the presence of God intensifies, there will also be a judgment of sin that will come with it. We love Acts chapter 2, when Pentecost happens and 3,000 people get saved. We quickly spin over Acts chapter 4, when a couple called Ananias and Sapphira simply say to the leaders in God's people, I sold a piece of land for this much, when actually they sold it for that much. Doesn't seem to be a lot, but Peter says to them, You haven't lied to man, you've lied to God. And the next thing is both of them fall down dead. God is not a God to be messed with. He is loving, he is for us, he is gracious. But he's also holy. And Jesus says the best way to get out of hypocrisy and living by a double standard, number one, make a choice to be transparent and open. Number two, fear the one who is our ultimate judge and deal with the issue in your life. If you have an issue going on in your life at the moment, can I encourage you, be brave enough, be bold enough, be courageous enough to bring it out into the open. Because Jesus will set you free from it, and you will be amazed at the liberty and the freedom and the life that you feel as a result. So Jesus says, number one, beware of being a hypocrite. Number two, the second thing that he says we should be aware of is beware of greed. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. That's where we get the story, the build a bigger barn. Wasn't that a great job from from you? Got to love a bit of Ishmael, haven't you? Build a bigger barn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But from that story, it ends. Jesus says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God." And then he goes on and talks about how God provides the disciples. And he ends up by saying, sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, for no thief comes near, no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. And Jesus is saying, the thing we need to guard our hearts against is the power of mammon and the power of greed. It's quite a challenging message, isn't it? When I, was, when I was preparing this, I was thinking, Jesus is talking 2,000 years ago. I wonder if the things that he tells us to protect our hearts against are the same things as today. Man, do we live in a materialistic culture. Man, do we live in a self-first culture. How much more do we need to protect ourselves against greed and ask Jesus to turn it upside down? So we learn not to be a greedy people, but rather a generous people. Love this quote from Timothy Keller. 
He's a great author and pastor in the States. Really, really great quote. Nobody thinks they're greedy. Nobody. In all my years as a minister, I've heard almost every kind of confession. I can second that. Nobody has ever come to me and said, I spend too much money on myself. Nobody has ever done that. But here's what I want you to consider. If Jesus talks about greed and materialism 10 or 20 times more than he talks about other sins, which he does, and he says that nobody thinks they're doing it, then we should start with a working hypothesis that it's probably a problem for me. Told you this was going to be a comfortable sermon on Mother's Day, didn't I? How often have we taught on and challenged greed? Maybe we need to a lot more in a materialistic age and really evaluate, actually, who am I living for? Because the truth is, we go back to the words of Jesus. Jesus says, there's power in mammon. There's power in materialism. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, he says, we can't serve two gods. He says, you cannot serve both God and mammon, for you'll hate one and love the other. And you see, there's a spiritual power in greed that we need to unseat. Got another great quote from Andy Stanley, who I really respect in, in leadership. If you want to put up the next slide, that'd be great. There's the quote from Matthew 6 about no one can serve two masters. Andy Stanley underneath it. Until Jesus is first in your finances, Jesus isn't first. You're not a follower, you're a user. And Judas tried that. Didn't end well for him. What Jesus is saying is if you're authentically going to follow me, I want to turn your whole life around so that everything you do and all that you are is surrendered to me and then is used to service and to further the kingdom of God's agenda in the world around. And that needs to hit in to our money and our finances. I'm a believer in, in, in tithing. I think in the New Testament we shouldn't do less than the Old Testament. I'm a great believer in tithing. But you know, if you track it back in the Old Testament... Tithing wasn't like a tax. It wasn't like I pay X percent to the government and then I pay X percent to the church and then I can do whatever I want with the rest of it. That wasn't the way that tithing worked. What you had to do in the Old Testament with tithing is you had to bring the first of what you had. And when people bought the tenth, they were bringing the first of what they had. And it was actually a faith statement. They'd bring the first fruits of the harvest and have to trust God for the rest. It was a faith statement that said, I'm giving this tenth first as a sign to say it all belongs to you. It's all yours. And it's so tempting to think, well, I've done my bit. I've given my 10%. Actually, all that we have belongs to Jesus. And Jesus are wholehearted people. Jesus wants all that we have to be surrendered to him to see the kingdom of God come. I've got a great uh, sympathy for the approach of John Wesley. What John Wesley used to do, he, of course, the founding father of Methodism. What John Wesley used to do is he used to decide what he needed to live a relatively frugal lifestyle each year, and then he gave all the rest away. And so in many ways, often he lived on the 10% and gave away the 90%. How radical is that? But isn't it significant that that caused, or maybe was part of then, a significant move of God in this nation that impacted the world? Because at the start, it was started with a radical commitment from somebody who said, I'm surrendered to Jesus. Do you know what? Also in their Methodist classes every week, in their Methodist small groups each week, they had to say to one another, here's the sin that I've been tempted with, and here's where I've fallen. And they had a radical commitment to holiness, and they had a radical commitment to surrender, and God was able to move. Like I said, I've got big dreams, I've got big prayers for restore, but you know, we're only going to get there if we've got a same radical commitment to holiness and a same radical commitment to surrender. Next Sunday, we have a giving day. Can I say, you're not doing us a favour by giving. We're doing you a favour by giving you the opportunity to free yourself from the power of materialism. And some of us, we need to do something above and beyond what we normally would do because without meaning to, greed has crept into our heart. 
And we've done our little bit, but we've not surrendered the lot. Next Sunday, what about we make faith statement and we say, we're not going to live under the power of money. Actually, we're going to live under the freedom that Jesus has. We're not going to be a greedy people. We're going to be a generous people. So when Jesus says, pray that you won't be led into temptation, what he says is, make sure you're not a hypocrite. Make sure you're not living a double life. Be someone who's transparent, who's open, who's pure, who's clearly, who, who fears God above all. And then he says, free yourself from the spirit of this age. Surrender everything to me and live a generous life. And then he wraps it up with one more phrase. And that's about how we should live. And he says this, he says, be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. And then he talks about the second coming and the fact that Jesus is coming back to earth. And when he comes back to earth, he will judge us. And I'm not one of those end time watchers, although I am interested by the wars and the rumours of wars and the plagues that may be happening at the moment. One of the reasons I'm not an end time watcher in particular is because whenever the end is coming, it shouldn't change how we're living. We're called to do the same thing. This good news of the kingdom of God shall be preached in the whole world as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. That's our job. And Jesus says, live like you're ready for if Jesus came back tomorrow. And he says, be ready for service. And he says, have your lamp burning. Be ready for service is be surrendered. Don't live for the things of this world. Live for the kingdom of God, the purposes of God. Have your lamp burning. That to me sounds like being the light of the world. And when Jesus talks about being the light of the world, he says, get your eye clear, get your heart clear. Then your body will be full of light. That talks to me about purity. So Jesus says the same two things. And I think these are key, key, key for being a church that is in the place that Jesus can use. That we're ruthless about not being a church that falls under temptation because we've been ruthless about living a transparent, open, authentic life. Dealing with the sin in our hearts, getting ourselves free from it and removing the eye disease. Do you remember when people used to talk about sin, calling it the eye disease because it's got eye in the middle? We get rid of a self-focus we get rid of a living for ourselves. We jettison that and say, all that I have is for you, Jesus. My whole life is for you. And maybe it's no surprise that after Jesus says, pray, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. He then says, all of the power, all of the glory, all of the honour belongs to you. And it's a people that are fully surrendered to Jesus that will lead the world to give all glory and all honour to Jesus and put him first. I want to finish this morning my talk now. You'll probably be pleased to hear that. You can go and run to the chocolates if you want in a few minutes. But before that, can I just say, we need to be a Jesus-first people and a Jesus first church. My heart, a long, long, long time ago, I made a choice that I was going to surrender everything I had to Jesus. And it was the best choice that I've had. And I still regularly come to a point that I surrender my marriage, my home, my kids, my family, my relationships, my heart, my bank balance. And I surrender my role, my position, I surrender it all. Because what Jesus is looking for is a fully surrendered people. And it's a fully surrendered people that he can use to change the world. The musicians are going to come back and lead us in worship in a moment. But I would do you a disservice if I didn't give you an opportunity just to quietly sit before God and to weigh up some of what I've been sharing this morning and indeed that Jesus teaches. So let's just take a moment in silence and let's sit before God. I just want to ask you, is Jesus really first in your life right here and right now? If he isn't, let's take a moment just to surrender afresh to him. Surrender our hearts, surrender our lives, surrender who we are to him. For some of us, maybe it's a while since we surrendered everything. 
Maybe in these moments, you just want to surrender your home. Maybe you want to surrender your finances. Maybe you want to start surrendering your relationships. Maybe you want to surrender your kids. Maybe you want to surrender your time. Maybe you want to surrender your priorities. And let's just where we are, let's start surrendering and inviting Jesus to come and be first in them. And I'm sure that there's some of us, and we know at the moment, we've got stuff that we've hidden. We've got darkness in our lives that we've tolerated or welcomed, but we've never brought into light. It says in 1 John, if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our wrongdoing. Maybe for some of us this morning, we need to confess our viewing of pornography. We need to confess the damage that that's done to our marriages, our relationships, our purity of heart. Maybe we need to confess the alcohol that we've been running to. Maybe the food that you've been running to. Maybe your greed isn't a greed for money. Maybe it's a greed for food. Let's let the Holy Spirit just convict us. And if there's stuff that's up near the surface, let's, in these moments, let's just surrender it to Jesus. Do you know, the, the best place you can be is the place of surrender. The f- most freeing place you can be is the place of transparency and openness. The reason that God's put us in a church community is because sometimes we need other people to help walk us through these things. Do you know, I, every six weeks I spend an hour talking to the former head of psychiatry of the Maudsley Hospital, a lovely, spirit-filled, retired Christian man that is one of my places of transparency and openness. I have some friendships some other church leaders that whenever we walk through difficult times, we bring one another into it because it's our safety and our security. That's a culture that we want to carry in the heart of Restore. You can break the power of hiddenness this morning by stepping into the light. You press the live prayer button. You're not going to shock anyone. Nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to shame you. You're going to get somebody who's going to run to come alongside you and minister in the forgiveness and the grace of God so you can be set free. Maybe the wisest choice you can make today is to click that button. If you're frightened of doing that, email me. Email someone else in the Restore team. WhatsApp someone, connect with someone. Let's not be a shallow church. It all looks good on the front, but actually we're we're a couple of inches deep, really. Let's be a deep, authentic church that goes deep with God and deep with our journey with one another. Let's worship God and continue to invite the work of his spirit into our lives.